Okay. Uh, Commissioner May, Commissioners, good afternoon. It is now 530. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good to see you. We're going to start our work session tonight uh, with a presentation by Stephen Hunt on the Valley Regional Transit Funding Request. He will be doing a presentation for us. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. And I am going to try and share my screen. Okay, there we, there we have it. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. I'm happy to be here to talk about um, both a quick update on what VRT has been up to over the last 12 to 18 months and talk about the request for FY 2021. So the presentation will move quickly through projects that we completed this last year, what our long-term projects are moving forward, a, a brief overview of our performance this last year, and then the local allocations and requests. Um, over the last 18 months or so, we have implemented the automatic passenger counters, which is a uh, it's an automated system on our vehicles that allow us to count passengers as they board and light the buses. This allows us to have stop level information, where people are getting on and where they're getting off, allows us to do better uh, planning as well as reporting out to our, to our stakeholders. Last October, we implemented a fare increase, which put us on track to increase our directly generated revenues until COVID-19 uh, kind of blew a hole both in our fair revenues and, and our ridership this year. But uh, some of that has been mitigated by the by the fare increase that we took last October. We also, a year in May implemented, a year ago in May implemented mobile ticketing, which makes it easier for people to purchase passes. They can, they can buy their pass on their phone rather than having to pay cash on the bus or buy tickets at, at any of the um, outlets that we have them or at Main Street Station makes it easier for people to, to board the bus as well as in, as we're moving through COVID now, it makes it easier for them to uh, pay without having to be close to people and we'll be leveraging that actually mm -hmm. forward to, to touch the fare systems. We also, uh, to improve our directly generated revenues, moved our media sales in-house and we're on track to exceed the amount that we generated from media sales in past years by having uh, a closer closer work and a touch on that. So this is all of the, the revenue that we get from sales of uh, advertising on the sides of buses and inside the buses, so bus wraps, etc. We also launched CityGo, which was an effort, a joint effort uh, with VRT and our partners to increase the um, visibility of alternative transportation options into downtown Boise and generate easier pass programs with, uh, with partners such as Boise State and, and other large employers and allow us to expand actually our, our fair revenues from uh, past programs beyond what we've been able to do in the past. So that, that got launched last October, I believe it was, or November. Um, we also implemented our first electric vehicle procurement, began that this last year with a successful uh, low, no emission uh, grant that we received from the FTA. And we're in the process of making room for electric vehicles in our fleet. And in the middle of all that, we updated our local cost allocation methodology, and we'll speak to that here in a few minutes. Long-term projects that are underway um, from Valley Connect 2.0, which was adopted back in 2018, we had planned and will extend service out to Eagle in October. So those were changes that were planned to take place in March of this year, but got delayed because of COVID, and those will, that will start in October. Uh, next year, we'll begin service in Meridian between 10 Mile and the Village, or Kleiner Park. We also will be developing a five-year service and capital plan. The draft of that plan will actually be in front of our board in their August board meeting, hoping to have a final version of that adopted in October of this year. We completed the State Street TOD study, which we uh, presented to this commission in the past. We began a State Street Alternative Analysis, which is just looking at the paths that would 
that transit would take between uh, State and Whitewater and downtown Boise. We have continued to staff the State Street Executive Team, which includes representatives from uh, ACHD as well as CCDC, the City of Boise, uh, City of Eagle, ITD, uh, Ada County, and Garden City about how to continue to move forward on the State Street TTOP on the on the land use and transit elements of that of that plan. Um, and uh, those are also supported by the actions that we've been taking in, in the immediate term of extending service to Eagle, increasing frequency on the State Street route. We'll be having 30 minute all day, 30 minute service all day on Saturday, again, starting in October. In addition to all of that, we will be piloting on-demand transit in Canyon County starting this October, where we'll be able to be providing uh, transit in a more dynamic fashion between destinations throughout Canyon County. We will be using what we learned there to potentially apply in other low demand areas in, in Ada County as well. Um, when we look at ridership, it kind of are taking a pre-COVID and post-COVID look at this. Um, ridership growth over 2019, we had seen growth in the in the routes where we had made investments. Because uh, last year we also made some investments in the two Broadway, the three Vista, made some changes to the State Street route and the 12 Maple Grove and the Hyde Park route. And we saw increases in ridership on all of those um, compared to 2019. And as we looked at the first quarter of 2020, we saw additional growth on some of the other routes that we'd made changes to. And in January, we saw system-wide growth over 19, um, going right up into COVID. And so we were, we were excited about the direction of our ridership growth at that point. However, since COVID, um, so you can see this, this peak that we had Coming from January into March, we saw some increase, but then it's been down 40 to 50 percent since um, mm -hmm. since COVID hit. The nadir of that coming in April, we started to see some of that uh, work its way back up a little bit. Although once things closed again towards the end of June, we've seen a little bit of, of a decline. But we're we've leveled off between 40 and 50 percent down over where we were pre-COVID. Uh, we expect that that will rebound when the economy and everything opens back up entirely. We've been taking action in the meantime to ensure that we're able to provide safe transportation uh, to those who are ride, continue to need to ride, uh, doing a number of things, cleaning the buses and installing driver shields between passengers and drivers, um, and closing Main Street Station. That's another thing that we have done to ensure that people are able to keep distance between themselves. And we've moved all of our operations up onto, onto the surface streets in downtown Boise. And we appreciate the coordination that we've had with ACHD on uh, managing some of the curb space there to facilitate that. So thank you. On-time performance, we also were seeing pre-COVID uh, some in improvements in on-time performance. And we've seen actually that be sustained through COVID. Our on-time performance actually has continued to be good, but that's to be expected. Um, travel demand has ch changed a lot since COVID happened and there's been less congestion in general. But we were encouraged by the changes that we were able to make last year and we were seeing improvements in on-time performance in virtually all of the routes that we have in Ada County. Um, and and we continue, we'll look forward to continuing to make improvements on our on-time performance. So to get to the matter at hand, we want to talk about the local allocation and our FY 2021 20, request of Ada County Highway District. In January, with the resolution VEB 2002, our board adopted the funding request based on the new method, the new allocation methodology. So the, the reason that we needed to review how we were, how we were um, making requests of our local partners is because we, we realized that the current, the method that we've had wasn't as tra transparent or objective. It didn't balance all of our costs across our 
partners as efficiently um, and over time had become out of balance and comp compared to where services were being provided, who was providing support for the regional services. And, um, and so we looked at a way of, of objectively dividing all of those, all of those costs. Since then, however, uh, we recognized that the world shifted again with the coronavirus. And so we modified our funding requests for FY21 showing both the old methodology and the new methodology. So the letter that you all received from us in the spring had two different two different numbers on it. One was uh, a funding request based on the traditional method, and another was the one based on the new methodology. So I would just take a minute to describe the new methodology and then um, answer any questions you may have about it. So the the local allocation process that we have adopted has three main steps. First, it identifies of all of our expenses, what is the local share? How much of that is to be borne by our local partners? Once that's identified, we categorize those costs into different buckets, whether that's a general assessment, a special allocation, or a service and capital contribution. And so depending on what kind of partner you are, you may pay one or all of those types of costs. Um, are the city of Boise, for example, pays all three types of those. They have special projects that they are interested in um, us pursuing and, and contribute special allocations. There's all, all partners have a general assessment and they also contribute specifically for service and capital. Um, ACHD has, has been charged a general assessment in, in the past, we've called it dues. Um, and that's the typically the only cost that we that we charge Ada County Highway District or request, excuse me, that we request of the Ada County Highway District. Um, other ways that Ada County Highway District is a little different from our other partners is we we had to think about how we were. There are a number of partners six that don't have tip, um, typical populations, so these are. In the same way that a jurisdiction, the city jurisdiction or a county jurisdiction has, because among those partners, we have we typically share that general assessment based on population. But where population is either shared or doesn't really isn't isn't exclusive to a jurisdiction, we had to come up with a different way of of sharing those costs. And so there are six partners that fall into that category. ACHD is one of them. The Canyon County Highway Districts are another. Uh, CWI. Boise State and are, are some of the others. And among those non-population partners, we distributed those the general assessment costs at a rate of 7.5%, which was the historical share that those non-population partners had uh, contributed to the general assessment. And the update that we had with this um, allocation was we we split those costs evenly among the non-population partners. So that's a lot of words. I hope to, to illustrate that better in this chart here, which is intended to isolate the different types of uh, impacts that the local allocation update has created. So if we look at, so these are the six non-population members um, in our service area, Ada County Highway District, Boise State, CWI, uh, CCDC, the Meridian Development Corporation, and together the Canyon County Highway District. So that is inclusive of Nampa, Hi Nampa Highway District as well. Um, so in the past, the general assessment that we had, if we looked at FY 2020 and the general assessment and the old methodology was the, was 326,000 or 29,000 and Seven and a half percent of that was distributed among these non-population members, but it was it was not equal. The share between them varied from, as you can see, from 2,800 to 6,200 with from Boise State. And there are two things that changed with this methodology. One is we we recategorized some expenses that changed what was qualified as a general assessment cost. So that went from 329 to 4. So if we're looking at the first two columns. Um, 
there were more things that were added into the general assessment that in the past we had not included. And those were things like um, regional expenses, such as a portion of our IT department, a portion of our finance and administration department, a portion of the general admin that had not previously been included in the general assessment. So that went up. And then the distribution among our non-population partners we standardized to be the same among all of them. So you can see that if we had applied the same methodology in FY 2020, um, the amount would have been 5,100 among all of our, all of our non-population partners. So applying that same methodology now to 2021, you can see that uh, again, the, the same rate is applied to all of our non-population partners. The amount for general assessment has gone up um, a little bit. It's less than 2%. And the resulting amount that we would be requesting under the new methodology would be $5,222, which I would note is a little different than what was in the original email or letter we sent in the spring um, as we have refined our costs and expenses since then. So last slide, again, is just showing the comparison of what we did charge in 2020, what we would charge in 2021 if it was the same type of methodology as we had before. So this is the old methodology and the 2021 new methodology um, assessment. And I hope that helps explain uh, how we came to this new number, and I would be happy to stand for any questions. All right, thank you very much, Stephen, for um, presenting to us so we have a little bit better understanding of the new methodology here. Uh, Commissioner Baker has yeah. a couple comments. Thank you. I, I don't want to take up a lot of time because we really don't have a lot, but I just want to point out, Stephen, that I believe, and, and this in context is not a huge jump. Get that. Not a problem. However, I do believe that you guys received $20 million from the state. Uh, on that, you know, money from the federal government. So I don't know what you're spending that on, but it certainly seems like that could cover any local um, match under your scenario here that, you know, at least for the next year. But the, but the other thing is also is that commuter ride is not receiving the amount of funding from VRT that it normally should. Um, I know that that commuter ride has brought in one and a half million dollars um, due to their ridership and their and their management, and it, they need money from the from the um, what's it called the large urban in order to replace vans for Ada County. And if they don't get that, they're not going to be able to provide the service at the levels that they are now, and that million dollars might go away. So I think that there's more to discuss here than just you know, $2,000 increase. Um, so what, what do you say to that? Thank you, Mr. President. A uh, couple things. One is you're absolutely right about the CARES Act uh, resources. Uh, there was about 12.8 million and 7.4 in the Boise urbanized area and 7.4 million in the Nampa urbanized area that is available to offset any, any um, shortfall in revenue or impacts because of COVID-19. And we, we in the, again, in the letter that we sent out in April, made that clear that that, that is something that's available. And we, that's one reason why we're, sh we're sharing this range for your information. Um, obviously, these are, voluntary these are voluntary contributions that all of our partners make. And so we will be able to, we're committed to, holding our service levels um, and serving the public constant throughout this time. Yes, we, we can cover what we need to for this and, and next year, likely. Um, but more importantly is the money that commuter ride needs to um, replace the vans in Ada County. And I, I, I'm sure you're aware, Ada County Highway District subsidizes commuter ride to the tune of about $200,000 a year also on top of that. Yes, and so we've been working with 
commuter ride on their needs. Um, and I mentioned one of the things that we have going to our board next month is the transportation development plan, which is a multi-year plan where we're able to look out and that's where we would like to show those costs for commuter ride and, and have a clear plan for the replacement of those vehicles and how those investments could best support public transportation. Sure, and, and that sounds good, but apparently VRT has not allocated any funds to commuter ride from the large urban since 2017, which is three years ago. I would have to check on that. Um, I know that there are, I, I would have to check on that. that Okay. True, but we we certainly have been talking to um, well Maureen. I don't know if she's taken a new position, but commuter ride on what their needs are for replacement, and there's been a um, there have been resources available for them to make those purchase those vehicles. In well, the, under the small under the smaller urban, there has been, but not on the larger urban. And but, and you can't you can't use the small urban funds in Nita County. So I right. mean. Hopefully you'll get this all resolved um, because, quite frankly, you know, I, I don't see any reason why ACHD should subsidize commuter ride if VRT isn't going to do their part since you're actually the one responsible for it. So. Sure. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you, Commissioner Baker, and thank you, Stephen. Um, we are running a little short on time. Uh, I think this is a lot of food for thought and we need to continue this discussion. Um, do any other commissioners have a quick comment? Otherwise, uh, we'll move on to our next presenter. Okay, hearing none. Stephen, thank you very much. We appreciate the information you've provided this evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up for our work session, Fairview Avenue, Locust Grove to Eagle Road, debrief on recent public involvement, presentation by staff, Mr. McCarthy. Good evening. Uh, we have about... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. I know. Uh, <laughs> Brian I know McCarthy, you know the drill. <laughs> Brian McCarthy, the project manager for the Fairview Avenue, Locust Grove Road to Eagle Project which also includes the intersection of Fairview and Locust Grove. Uh, we're here today to present to you the results from the first open house that was held for the project. This was held at the concept design phase, so the displays that were shown to the and posted on the website were from our concept design. It ran in from June 10th to June 26th. From that, we received 116 total comments. Uh, with the regular advertisements such as the postcards and emails and uh, signs out on site, we also contacted all the businesses along the corridor directly. So that was either emails or phone calls directly to the businesses. And from that, we held a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings with some of the businesses that were interested in discussing the project further. I, I also want to note that city staff or city of Meridian staff presented to the Meridian City Council on two occasions during this time period as well. The project it includes the widening of Fairview and Locust Grove. Uh, this Again, this display was uh, the same display that was shown during the open house. So that consists of a nine by seven intersection, and that is nine lanes on the Fairview legs, seven lanes on the Locust Grove legs. So that's three eastbound, three westbound, and two uh, left turn lanes and a right turn lane for the Fairview and the same configuration for Locust Grove but only with the two northbound and the two southbound lanes. We have continuous sidewalk throughout the project corridor. We have a five foot bike lane with a two foot buffer strip throughout the project corridor as well. And I want to point out in the center on Fairview Avenue the red uh, island right there at the crosswalk is a eight foot wide pedestrian refuge island to uh, facilitate pedestrian crossing of Fairview. Continuing to the east to Eagle Road, the widening uh, consists of a seven lane roadway on Fairview. So that is three eastbound lanes, three westbound lanes, 
and the center channelized turn lane. That, that center turn lane allows for left turns in to all the businesses along the corridor. We also have continuous sidewalk and we have the five foot bike lane with the two foot painted buffer strip throughout Fairview. The difference in colors there is the, the lightest purplish uh, grayish color is the existing asphalt. So that's actually currently uh, new asphalt that has just been placed uh, the last couple of weeks. With this project, we, we intend on maintaining that asphalt and widening on the shoulders. So the widening for the eastbound from Locust Grove to Eagle will only occur from the shoulders uh, north and south of there to add the additional bike lane and the uh, additional travel lane. We also have continuous street lighting for the corridor. And I do want to point out at Webway, it is not shown on the display, but it is a comment that was received from uh, Meridian City Council to consider installing a pedestrian hybrid beacon to cross Fairview at, at about Webway. Um, I also want to point out at Eagle Road, the current intersection configuration has uh, nine lanes on Fairview, which is the same uh, amount of lanes that we will have on Locust Grove, and then continuing east of Eagle Road on Fairview to Records Way, about 2,000 feet. Uh, it, it's currently built out to a seven lane roadway section with a five foot bike lane. This uh, display was also shared during the open house and it, it highlights all the crash history for the five year crash history through 2018, which is the most current history that we have. Uh, you can see at the intersection, there was a significant amount of, of crashes, but also as you continue further east away from the intersection at some of the business access points, there were also uh, a high number of vehicle accidents. Again, this is the, the crash history continuing to Eagle Road. The, the, the first question asked during the open house was, how do you feel about the design for Fairview, Locust Grove to Eagle? And we had 110 answered that one question. Over two thirds of those responses were in favor of the design. Some of the common comments that we heard were general agreement with the widening and the additional traffic lanes to increase uh, traffic flow and intersection capacity. There was a support and agreement to install bike lanes. However, there were uh, many that would like something more than uh, the five foot bike lane with the two foot buffer. There was uh, some current concerns regarding the business access with the channelized turn lanes. And uh, there was support for the continuous sidewalk. However, there were some other some comments that would like more to be done for pedestrians. And again, that the PHB at Webway was a comment that was received by the uh, city council. Uh, the next steps on the project is we are going to continue with preliminary design. We expect that submittal in September. From that, we will hold another online open house in the month of October, which will have our 75% our or our preliminary design displays. And then continuing design through um, March of 2021 with right away acquisitions programmed in 21 and 22 with construction program to begin uh, in December of 2022 and through uh, the summer of fiscal year 23. And I stand for any questions or, or comments. Madam President. Thank, uh, just one moment. Um, thank you, Brian. Uh, I think this probably warrants a little bit more discussion than we have been able to have this evening. So um, I would like an opportunity to have that um, in the near future here. Um, great job. I do support the project. Um, I'm all for the connectivity and providing that in, in the safest way possible. I do, I read all the comments that you got and I do have um, some concerns about that buffered bike lane. That's uh, such a busy street, high volume, and it just makes me nervous that the um, buffer is just a coat of paint. So I would like to have a little bit of a discussion on that um, with you as well. Uh, Commissioner Goldthorpe, you had a comment? Yes, one was about the bike lane. I'd like to see uh, uh, pictures with either a 10 foot uh, multi-use path or a side path. And I'd like to know 
uh, why we are doing the medians differently than we did at Cole and Fairview. So the, the medians at Cole and Fairview, the... Well, there we, we had like, what, a thousand feet or something? And then it was, it's, there's nothing. And here we, it looks like we've got uh, some constraints for the uh, vehicles going left into the different access points. And I'm wondering why. That's correct. So at, directly at the intersection at Fairview and Locust Grove, we have uh, a, a similar configuration that is at Fairview and Cole with the 800 right. feet of, of median at the intersection. But with the widening continuing uh, to Eagle Road with the seven lane uh, configuration of three travel lanes that the left out would have to cross, we were restricting the left out but maintaining the left in with the channelized turn lanes. Okay, that needs to be discussed some more. Any other uh, comments from commissioners or questions for Brian? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Mayor. I have a lot of comments. Uh, Commissioner Hanson? Oh, okay. I said I had a lot of comments, but if we're going to continue, mm -hmm. um, I'll share those then. I, I can okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it does warrant some more discussion. And um, uh, Brian, you've put a lot of work in this, and, and we appreciate it. And, and it's a very important project. So I would like to, to schedule the time for you to come back when we're not so rushed. And again, I apologize that the time kind of got away from us. Sure. It looks like we're straight up 6 o'clock, and we're going to ha have to get into our meeting. I'm sorry, Commissioner Arnold? Thank you. I, I do think we need to have a more in-depth uh, presentation and discussion on this. I've been contacted by a business owner who is very concerned about the access and also feels like we are going back on, on a decision we made a few years ago not to include medians. So we definitely need to have a more in-depth discussion on this item before we make any decisions or give staff any further direction. All right, thank you very much. I think that appears to be the consensus, so we will get something scheduled. Mr. McCarthy, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner May, Commissioners, it is slightly past six. All right. <laughs> Welcome everyone. I will now call our July 22nd commission meeting to order and we will begin, begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Director Wong, if you would please lead us. Yes, please stand and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, this evening, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to recognize and thank Clint Heck and Lively, crew chief for our Adams Gray crew. We appreciate Clint and his continued dedication and outstanding leadership during these very challenging times, especially for our maintenance operations team. He has ensured that our Adams Gray crews continue to successfully answer all calls for road and alley repair, as well as all city support requests. Most recently, Clint was instrumental in supporting Ada County's emergency management COVID mask distribution project by ensuring the appropriate, appropriate traffic control materials were in place in multiple locations throughout Ada County to provide a safe distribution process for all users. A very well-received and appreciated effort there. Clint, thank you very much for a job well done. All right, next on our agenda, before we um, formally adopt our agenda, I would like to read a comment. On July 21st, 2020 at 11 a.m., the ACHD secretary posted an amendment to the meeting agenda, which is less than 48 hours prior to tonight's regular meeting. The purpose of the amendment was to add resolution 2319 to item number two on the consent agenda. Resolution 2319 is a response to the board's joint meeting with the City of Boise. The purpose of the resolution is to support local businesses to temporarily increase the outdoor footprint to accommodate the appropriate social distancing guidelines between customers in response to COVID-19. Do I have a motion to adopt the proposed amended agenda? So moved. 
All right, we have a motion and a second. Second. All right, all in, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a commissioner or citizen so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. All consent agenda items are commission action items unless noted. Do we have a motion? Madam President, I would move to approve the consent agenda. All right, thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Yes. All right, we have a second. All in favor? State by aye. saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Ma Madam President, could I just say one word or a couple words? Two words. <laughs> Two words. I just want to express my great appreciation to Steve um, uh, Price for putting the resolution together. It accurately captured, we couldn't debate it when it was up for, up for approval, right? Uh, but I just want to express my appreciation for that. And because time is of the essence, I would ask that our um, communications team communicate this back out to the business community, uh, DBA, chambers, and others, uh, so that the businesses know this is available. Um, because if they don't know, they won't ask. If they don't ask, it doesn't get processed. So it, it really is now in their hands to then say, oh, I'd like something to happen and work with their city and ACHD. And we have committed in this resolution to move expeditiously to make it happen. So I would just uh, respectfully ask our communications team to get the word out there as much as possible. Absolutely, and I think that's the plan for them to do just that. So thank you very much. And Mr. Price, on behalf of the entire commission, thank you very much for turning this around so quickly. All right, the first item on our regular agenda this evening is a proclamation of recommitment to full implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Director Wong. Uh, Madam President, Commissioners, again, uh, we are fully supported recommendation, or recommending that you do support this, celebrating 30 years uh, of great uh, support uh, to this incredibly critical program. So, Commissioners, you have that in front of you. Uh, and uh, uh, back to you, Commissioner May. All right, thank you very much. Commissioners, you have this item before you. Any questions or discussion? I'd be happy to entertain a motion to adopt. Madam President, I, I moved to adopt. I thought we were, we were going to have- Or approve. Pardon me? I was, I'll move to adopt, but I thought someone from our ADA committee was going to speak. No, Director Wong. Oh, okay, well, I'll move to adopt that resolution. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? All right, we have a motion with a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Director Wong. All right, next on our agenda is resolution number 2306, vacation of public right-of-way for a portion of West Belmont Street, South Vermont Avenue, South Manitou Avenue, South Grant Avenue, and the alley right-of-way located in blocks 13, 19, and 22 of South Boise First Subdivision, Boise State University, Idaho State Board of Education. Before we start, I'd like to reiterate my previous declaration that my son is employed by BSU. Are there any other declarations before we open? Yes, right. Madam Chair. Hearing that? Oh, Commissioner Arnold, sorry. My uh, son is a graduate of Boise State University, and I also have taken a few classes there um, many years ago. All right, thank you very much. Any others? Uh, Madam President, back, Mr. In, Hansen. I, back in 1992 and 93, I worked at Boise State University, which I disclosed in the previous hearing. Right. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hansen. My children attended there as well. So quite a, <laughs> quite a lot of involvement with, with Boise State. Um, all right, hearing no other declarations, I will go ahead and open our public hearing and we will hear from staff, Ms. Christy Little. Thank you, Madam President, Commissioners. Christy Little, Development Services Manager. I'm not gonna go through all of the same slides we went through last time. Um, provided you with a lot of new information in your packets though. Um, so this is the proposed 
vacation a public right of way on the Boise State University campus and their southeast campus area. On this map in yellow is previously vacated and the proposed vacation areas are in red. Just a reminder for everyone that this came to the Commission on June 24th last month and the Commission denied the request to vacate. Boise State then requested reconsideration which the Commission approved on July 1st and now we're back to square one uh, with the public hearing. In 2010, ACHD and Boise State entered into a right-of-way vacation and property exchange agreement during which time ACHG agreed to consider the vacation of streets and alleys uh, to BSU with no monetary compensation and BSU agreed to make certain improvements and dedicate right-of-way. In 2019, both agencies executed a first addendum to the agreement relative to right-of-way and improvements and all conditions uh, from both agencies have been satisfied to date. This is just a portion of the approved master plan that shows improvements in the area for one to 10 years. This is from their 2015 master plan update and then their final plan. And again, those were included in your packet. Um, so I don't have any additional information to provide to you. Um, I know the applicant um, is here along with their traffic engineer. Um, so I might turn the time over to them unless the commission has any questions. Commissioners? Uh, Madam, Madam President, I just have one quick question. Commissioner Hinton. Um, yes, yeah, thanks, Christy. Um, the resolution 2306, is this identical? It looks like identical to the one that we heard on um, June 24th. There's no changes to the resolution. Madam President, Commissioner Hanson, you're correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you very much. We will now hear from Boise State. President, members of the commission, thank you for having us. I am Randy McDermott, Vice President for Campus Operations at Boise State. Joining me today are um, Drew Alexander, our Capital Asset and Development Manager, Matt Wild, our General Counsel, and Sonia DeLeiden from Kittleson. Like well, to welcome to all of you. Thank you. Um, we'd like to take a few minutes to walk through the history and context of this vacation application. And due to the scope and the amount of the content, we'd like to request a slight extension in our time allotment for a total of 15 minutes. Is that acceptable? Yes. We, I, I thought we had addressed that earlier today, so I'm sorry if you didn't get the word. No, no, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. With that, I'm going to quickly hand it off to Drew so that he can get us started. Thanks, Randy, and thanks, members of the commission, for the reconsideration. Welcome, the record. Drew. Uh, my name is Drew Alexander with Boise State University, 1910 University Drive, Boise, Idaho, 83725. Um, as Randy said, um, we're going to just start the presentation with a bit more background on con and context on what uh, got us here tonight. Um, so the conversation we're having began in earnest when three projects were approaching construction in 2010. Those were the Lincoln townhomes, the Norco building, and the Lincoln parking garage. Boise State desired streetscape improvements adjacent to these projects. A vacation of the right-of-way provided flexibility to deploy our design standards and lower the posted speed limit in a pedestrian concentrated area. As such, the university and ACHD began discussing a right-of-way and property exchange agreement sometimes referred to as a global vacation agreement. That agreement outlines a series of obligations for Boise State, including the creation of a master circulation plan, which is a separate and distinct transportation focused plan, not to be confused with Boise State's campus master plan. The agreement sought several items along Beacon Street, those being one, detached sidewalks and minor widening, the dedication of a 16-foot public right-of-way easement from Oakland Avenue to Denver Avenue, and the expectation for a signalized pedestrian crossing with two potential locations. Regarding the easement dedication, Boise State could only dedicate where property was owned, so a complete easement wasn't possible at the time. In accordance with the agreement, Boise State created its first campus circulation plan. This document was reviewed and accepted by ACHD staff. 
the plan uh, shows a vision for circulation that's very similar to what is proposed today with a collection of multimodal routes, some with a greater emphasis on pedestrian and bike connectivity than others. There was an emphasis on vehicular routes on the east and west of this area with the pedestrian focus bound around Manitou and Vermont Avenue. Also during this time, Boise State completed the sidewalk improvements and widening along Beacon from Oakland to Vermont. After completing these obligations in the agreement, the right of way adjacent to those projects were vacated and transferred to the university. Since then, we haven't had that amount of major facility growth in the area, but the one thing that has really changed is the ownership profile in the area. These next few slides are intended to show you that change in ownership starting in 1997. 2002, this is University Drive, if you can see my cursor. This is Beacon Street to the south. 2007, 2012, and a current snapshot from 2020. You may notice that there's one parcel, one property that the university doesn't own. However, we've been working in close coordination with this owner. We have an MOA in place that outlines protections for access, maintenance of the street and alleyway, snow clearing, and also protection for trash uh, pickup. That owner has signed the petition of support for tonight's request. Around 2016, 2017, there were some additional facilities on the radar. Uh, and these projects required uh, two separate alleyways for their site design, which prompted a second look at the agreement from 2010. With the ownership status significantly different, Boise State asked ACHD if a true global request was possible in this area. We consulted with ACHD staff and ultimately with the commission at a work session in January of 2018. It was recommended then that we complete a number of tasks before making this global request, the request that's before you tonight. Those are outlined here and they were captured in an addendum to the agreement. Overall, they added more clarity, specificity, deadlines, and expectations for those obligations that Boise State had on its list. Um, you'll see that a location was selected for the pedestrian crossing and there are certain uh, deliverable dates for the remaining infrastructure improvements along Beacon. In addition, the Commission directed Boise State to update the data uh, via a supplement to its circulation plan from 2012. Um, we uh, have a lot more content on that, but um, progress that had been made um, since that work session includes the full dedication of that 16 foot public right of way that runs from Denver Avenue to Oakland Avenue. And then also a completion of that uh, signalized pedestrian crossing at Manitou and Beacon. As I mentioned, we did uh, complete a traffic impact study and I'm gonna save many of the comments for uh, Kittleson Associates. But the thing that I wanted to really emphasize is that when we embarked on this update, we uh, vetted the scope closely with ACHD staff and City of Boise staff because we wanted to make sure that we captured uh, all possible scenarios. And as you see here, we modeled five different scenarios, three of which were to take a close look at a, a baseball field development if that were to happen. And we all know now that that program is suspended and is not moving forward. But fortunately, we also looked at background conditions and background growth that reflects what the master plan has on it currently. And those two models all had um, street modifications and one without street modifications. We really performed a very robust study um, to update that data in the, in, the in the circulation plan. At the previous hearing, uh, we heard a lot about community connectivity. And our hope is that the next slides will convey how this area of campus intersects with the surrounding transportation network. On this slide, the study area is outlined in red with the blue showing existing bikeways in and around campus and the yellow showing planned bikeways. These are taken directly from the Roadways to Bikeways plan adopted by ACHD in 2018. You will see that Manitou is the priority leading to campus north and south and aligns very well with the crossing improvements Boise State recently completed. This next slide simply zooms in on that area, 
showing the study area in red, existing routes in blue, and planned routes in yellow. Again, Manitou is our emphasis and aligns very well with the roadways to bikeways plan and our on-campus circulation plan with a strong emphasis on a pedestrian and bikeway corridor on that street. Finally, this image is sh was shown at the last hearing. And what you see are streets that remain under ACHD ownership in blue, multimodal routes that Boise State would control in orange, and two pedestrian and bike corridors um, along Manitou and Vermont. We understand that there's some concern about these pedestrian and bike routes and a closure of the streets. A major bikeway project would likely happen alongside a facility project. Since there are no planned facilities in the near term along these routes, it is much more likely that we'll paint sharrows or some other form of low cost improvement to make marginal gains for cyclists. If fully redesigned at a future date, it may be likely that the routes resemble a dressed up downtown alleyway or a fire lane, something a car could still drive down if it opted to, but with a clear priority for pedestrians and bicyclists and very slow posted speeds. The main change for these two routes in green is a change in hierarchy with non-motorists being at the top. Vehicles may very well still be allowed, but other better routes will be available for cars nearby, including on several ACHD-owned streets. This is a quote taken from the 2012 Campus Circulation Plan, and I think it still holds uh, a lot of relevance today. Essentially what it says is that our community is evolving, it's a growing community, and there's this continually open door to evaluate additional uh, transportation improvements along these corridors uh, surrounding campus, specifically as building development occurs. And we anticipate working in partnership with H ACHD as that happens. As we implement our master plan and build facilities, especially along Beacon, we fully anticipate, uh, again, working in partnership and making sure that corridor remains safe and effective for campus and the community. This shows you the streets that were vacated 10 years ago, and hopefully it's obvious that they're still open and they're still very much streets for all modes of travel. These are a few images of streets that we have in our request that are still owned by ACHD. We think it's noticeable that it's a stand for some improvements that would be appropriate on a university setting, primarily sidewalks for the high concentration of pedestrians that visit our campus each and every day. Uh, to, to close out my portion here, I just wanted to touch on some additional benefits that ACHD and the general public would gain from this request. Anything that's vacated, obviously Boise State will perform all road maintenance and improvements to those streets and alleys. Boise State will also handle all snow plowing and cleaning of those rights of way. But maybe most importantly is that Boise State will gain access to this infrastructure so that we can deploy utility projects things that you don't often see every day. Having that flexibility introduce project efficiencies that saves taxpayer dollars, not just in the project deployment, but over time. And we have two very real examples of projects at the moment. One under design is an irrigation project that's best suited for placement in the middle of the Belmont Street corridor. Another is a bioreactive barrier that we would like to place in the Grant, Street, Grant Avenue corridor. And that's to help to mitigate the environmental impacts of the laundromat and dry cleaning facility that was south of Beacon, which has a perk plume that we still uh, wrestle with to this day. Both of those would stand to gain a lot of efficiencies from the request before you. And with that, I believe it's uh, time for me to hand it off to uh, Sonia Delight with, with Kittleson. Thank, Thank you, you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, President May and commissioners. Happy to be with you here tonight. Sonia Delayden with Kittleson and Associates. I did send my contact information to Stacy through the chat. And um, I am going to supplement what Drew said uh, in the presentation he gave. Um, I and Kittleson Associates prepared both the uh, 2012 campus circulation study as well as the recent study to evaluate the vacations here in the southeast area of campus. Uh, I know you did not have access to this study when this item came before you back in June, so uh, hopefully you've had a chance to review that study now, and I'll hit on a few of the highlights. 
Um, I'll talk about the existing vehicle volumes and operations in this area of the campus, as well as the existing bicycle and pedestrian volumes in this area of the campus and then touch on the impact of the street vacations on vehicle operations, as well as the impact on the street, of the street vacations on the bicycle and pedestrian users' experiences. The so next slide, please, Drew. Thank you. So this graph uh, summarizes both the existing vehicle volumes and operations in the study area. You can see all of the intersections that we studied as part of this assessment for the street vacations, several intersections along University, uh, two sections along, along Lincoln, several intersections along Beacon Street, and then those along Broadway Avenue between University and Beacon as well. All of the intersections shown uh, with a green dot here meet HHD operational standards today. There is one you can see in red, that's the Belmont Broadway intersection. Uh, that is an unsignalized intersection, and so that critical left turn from Belmont to Broadway Avenue uh, currently does not meet ACHD standards. It does experience long delays to make that left turn out during peak hours, as you can probably imagine. However, the movement is, is well under capacity. The graph also shows the volumes on the streets that we are um, discussing tonight for vacation. So you can see here the peak hour volumes on these streets are relatively low, relatively small vehicle volumes. Um, through discussion with Boise State University, there is on-street parking on several of these roadways today. So it's anticipated that a lot of these volumes are really vehicles circulating for on-street parking, not using the streets for um, a lot of connectivity or their primary travel. Uh, most of the streets that are being proposed to be vacated have less than 25 or 30 volumes in the peak hour peak direction. Belmont Street has slightly more volume as you can see, uh, 60 vehicles in the peak direction west of Manitou and 46 uh, east of Manitou. But again, as Drew highlighted, Belmont um, although will be vacated and moved, or is being requested to be vacated and moved to Boise State ownership, it will still be open for vehicles to circulate if needed. So next slide, please, Drew. This graphic shows the existing bicycle and pedestrian volumes in the study area. We collected these in 2018 um, and when school was in session. So thankfully we had this data before the current pandemic impacts uh, influence does. Um, I think some critical things to note here is that you can see there is very good uh, bicycle and pedestrian activity in this area, probably not uh, probably expected given the campus uh, environment and the fact that Boise State has been trying to uh, create a campus where uh, students and faculty can access the campus by non-vehicular modes. Um, another thing I do want to point out is you can see in the bottom, sort of bottom center of the graphic, the crossing demand on Manitou Avenue. Um, that is along the Beacon Street corridor. That was one of the locations that had the highest demand for pedestrian crossings. Um, and particularly uh, at a good spacing from Lincoln Avenue, which already had a signalized crossing. So as part of the study that we did in 2018 and the volumes and the demand profiles that we collected, that was a key driver and a key recommendation that came out of the study was to install that protected pedestrian and bicycle crossing, the pedestrian hybrid beacon at Manitou to serve those volumes. Next slide, Drew. Thank you. Uh, this graphic shows the future vehicle operations with the street vacations in place. You can see that there's not much difference or any difference between this graphic and the one I showed you of existing operations. To evaluate this scenario, we made the overly conservative assumption that any vehicles currently now today uh, using streets that would be that are proposed for vacation would reroute. Uh, as we know, that's probably not the case because Belmont, it will still be open to vehicle circulation. Um, there will still probably be vehicles using it to circulate to different areas. 
but we made the conservative assumption that all vehicles would move off of those roadways and utilize University Drive, Lincoln, or Beacon Street. You can see even with that conservative assumption, because those volumes are so low, uh, there is no impact to how the intersections are operating and whether or not they're meeting ACHD standards, and which is still in question is again that belt, that left turn out of Belmont to Broadway Avenue, which is service F but under capacity as is in uh, existing conditions. Next slide. And I'll briefly summarize, I think Drew's graphics that he shared tell a very nice story, but we did evaluate how these street vacations will impact the pedestrian and bicycle experience. We evaluated that based on level of traffic stress, uh, as well as based on network connectivity using FHWA's guidebook for measuring network connectivity. Uh, and we also compared it against ACHD's um, bicycle matrix for bicycle facilities. Uh, short story, as you probably saw in Drew's photos, the streets that we are talking about today most currently have no sidewalks and no dedicated bicycle facility on them. Um, from a bicyclist perspective, that's probably all right given the volumes are so low, but it's definitely not comfortable and especially not comfortable for a pedestrian. And as Drew showed in his graphics, um, of the streets, how Boise State has been building out these streets, adding very robust pedestrian facilities, wide sidewalks, as well as streets that look uh, appealing to bicycle and other non-motorized users. Related to network connectivity, we evaluated a few criteria, network completeness, basically how much of the network has pedestrian and bicycle facilities on it, the density of the network, which obviously for people not in cars is very important to uh, make direct trips and uh, minimize their out of direction travel. We also evaluated route directness to get at those issues as well. And finally, network, the quality of the network that they were experiencing. Based on this, the only recommendation we had when we initially looked at the study was to ensure that there was a multimodal connection still maintained on Belmont Street between Euclid and Denver. Uh, as long as that remained in place, all of these criteria were either as good or better in the proposed vacation scenario than they are under existing conditions. So I think I'll wrap it up with that. Of course, Drew, both Drew and I are very happy to answer any specific questions that the Commission has. And I'll pass it off to Drew if there's any final thoughts. All right, thank you very much. Any questions from the commissioners? <clears throat> any clarification? All right, hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. We do have a few individuals that have signed up to address us. Uh, Ariel McCluskey. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for having me again, and I appreciate this opportunity. My name is Ariel McCluskey, and I live at 1919 Verna Lane. And BSU's lengthy vacation plan is not warranted by the content of tonight's agenda packet. This is our third public meeting, again founded on BSU's fallback of a 2015 master plan. Not only is ACHD blind to BSU's future design and timeline, so is the public. And this is a giant site that abuts neighborhoods plus existing arterials, namely University Drive and Beacon Road. And tonight's agenda packet on page 129, ACHD's letter under the heading University Drive number 11, even defines University Drive as a town center arterial abutting and providing connectivity to this vacation area and to reach BSU's recently purchased key building on the Boise River. Mindful that Beacon Road goes east already carries traffic to BSU's Park Center campus on Boise's Greenbelt. And I'm expressing that BSU has a lot of existing buildings that need all of the current existing roadways to be fair to all the travelers of our urban high density living. And lifting the veil tonight, 
is essential for the connectivity that will truly be available to the public in regards to free parking, if that should even survive any of this. Again, and this evening's agenda packet has additional public testimony endorsing ACHD to continue to facilitate our area's roadways when any development comes a calling, be they businesses, hospitals, or universities, et cetera. Our existing urban scene deserves a factual campus map that shows in detail the types of future time-stamped, built-out plans, not only with the ACHD, but with the city of Boise. On August 3rd, less than a week and a half away, BSU is scheduled to present their reduced rezone request for this land. And tonight, ACHD is casting the future of existing public roadways in and around existing high-density neighborhoods near our city's signature, the Boise River. And in short, we do appreciate your collective conscientious wisdom to please deny BSU's application that again tonight provides no viable public plan in real time. Thank you. I'm, I'm Thank happy you, Ariel. to questions, but I think you have read my letters. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, Mr. Ed McCluskey. Welcome, Ed. Oh, great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. If you could just state your name and address, great. please, sir. Ed McCluskey. I'm a professor emeritus residing at uh, 1919 Vernal Lane, Boise, Idaho. My recommendation is to deny this. Ask BSU to instead go into the working group when BSU, the city, SENA, and other stakeholders start working out the issues of what should happen near and around the campus. Now called the Collegiate Neighborhood Group, we meet for the first time next week, actually. What I have to say today, though, refers to BSU's July 13 letter at the top end of this reconsideration request. It's a two campus centric request, a backdoor exclusivity claim for that land. Neighbors also need those streets for auto traffic. We are not in the midst of some golden age of the bicycle, though many of us may wish that were true. To the extent we're talking about students, they still and will love their cars. Specific plans need to put, be put before the public in real hearings. A blanket vacation takes out the public, uh, takes them out of the picture, except to be merely informed by the state. Or with a Herculean burden of lobbying at the state house or a non-elected body, the State Board of Education. Our reasoning is simple, BSU says. Necessary oversight and flexibility to implement our master circulation plan. Those are highlighted as reasons, but flexibility for the master circulation plan actually says it all, really. BSU would have the flexibility, not ACHD, not the public. BSU says their oversight is required, but by and for whom? The letter asserts this plan calls for no closures of thoroughfares, but the blanket plan does close some thoroughfares and probably others in an undefined future we just don't know. An outdated 2018 traffic study is cited again here, supplemented with an appeal to good intentions. Intentions are not actions though, and both have a past. With blanket overreach for public land, streets can too readily drop out with public participation. The agreement mentioned in BSU's letter had no real public attention, by the way. Neighbors dispute the claim that no harm will come, but the public uses these streets and traffic gets pushed elsewhere. Rights of way need much more specific attention, perhaps case by case, but certainly with something better than this broad brush and its appeal to campus feel. Unelected officials will make irreversible decisions for public streets. BSU might be surprised at support when specific plans are offered here at ACHD, even with the working group I mentioned uh, as they join in support of more specific plans but not of a blanket plan like this. If alternatives take more time and money, even though money already has been spent, that's the price of doing business, I'm afraid, and the price of past decisions. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Mr. McCluskey. All right, our next uh, individual that has signed up to speak is Deanna Smith. Deanna, are you here? Thank you. I'm here. Good evening, Commissioner May and, and the rest of the commission. Um, I mostly wanted to- If you could go ahead and state your name and address, please, Deanna. Yeah, I sent it into Stacey. Did you? Okay, very good. Deanna Thank you. Smith, and she has my address via chat. All right. Um, sorry, my video went out. I, I missed most of the staff report and much of Drew's presentation, unfortunately, because I lost internet for a while. Oh, dear. Um, so, but I, I am aware of the fact that a statement I made at the last hearing was incorrect, and I just wanted to correct that for the record. I had, um, from what I could see, it appeared as though the northwest, the north-south connection for bikes really was non-existent. I since have, have learned that that is incorrect and that the two north-south um, streets that they're requesting vacation for would be bike pad only. Um, so I wanted to correct that. I, I, I still would say that I do think that I'm never a strong supporter of vacations. And while I don't have a strong opinion one way or other on this one, I would encourage the commission to look carefully at the larger network connection that they answered. They addressed that a little bit tonight. But if there's an alternative to vacation that would still allow them to move forward with this development, I think that would be superior. I think taking public right away away from the public forever can often prove to not be good in the long run. So those were my statements and thank you for your time. Thank you. Stacy, do we have anyone else that has signed up? I do not have anybody signed up. All right, thank you. Uh, Drew, did you want to address any of the concerns or questions that were brought up? Um, yeah, and I would like to offer that maybe too to Randy and Sonia as well. Uh, Absolutely. Do either of you want to jump in with a, a response or? Go ahead, Drew, I'll back clean up. Uh, yeah, I guess we appreciate all the feedback uh, and keep my response brief. But again, I, I, I hear a concern about, about closures and and ending access for the community where um, I hope there's enough evidence before the commission that um, that's not part of our plan with this circulation plan. Uh, we have routes still in place where they exist today. Some may shift over time for uh, a very low stress and improved pedestrian and cyclist environment. But that's not uh, a closure in our, in our opinion if that were to even happen. Um, you're still providing a, a really accommodating environment for the, the bulk of uh, the transfer, uh, transportation that happens in, in the campus around this area, as Sonia has shown. Um, and again, I think in response to specific plans, we've studied this twice now uh, in, a, uh, in a broad manner because it's a broad area, but we created a campus circulation plan to provide that specificity so that uh, the public and commissions could evaluate uh, a plan for this area of campus and how it relates to some of the facility and infrastructure growth that we have on the radar. Um, again, I hope now that uh, you've had the first study, the second study, and that supplement, in addition to some of the additional content we provided about community connectivity, um, that those statements that I'm making are, are, are more apparent than they were in June. Uh, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to, to stop and let Sonia or Randy chime in. All right, thank you. Thank you, there's, President there's, there's, uh, Sonia Dryden with Kittleson. I don't have a lot to add to what has said. Um, he covered it well. I think um, I'll just reiterate that the intent of the plan is to improve circulation, improve connectivity, and the analysis that we have completed demonstrates that it still maintains appropriate connectivity and operations and flow for traffic 
while improving the connections and the experience for bicyclists and pedestrians in this area. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Randy. President May, members of the commission, thank you. Let me just add a little bit more. Um, the improvements, as you, as you heard from Drew, will be focused on safety and aesthetics uh, in the near future. It will enhance travel to and through campus and also signal to visitors and students that they are in fact on Boise State's campus when they find themselves in this area. As it stands right now, as you can see from the pictures, there are parts of that area where it's actually hard to tell if you're on campus or not. And as an urban university whose property is either in very close proximity to or even intertwined with neighboring properties, it's important for us to be able to identify what is campus property and what is not campus property. And we think enhancing streetscapes are a good way to help signal that, um, that property. And while our accountability is through a different set of public officials, we are and will remain accountable to the public and our neighbors going forward. I had a light bulb moment this week after having conversations with some of the neighbors who have um, noted objections to this action. And what I now understand that I didn't quite understand before is that they prefer the public process through ACHD because it is familiar and they know exactly how their voice will be heard. And I don't blame them for that. Um, it, is a, it is a very straightforward process. It's very systemic. It's, it's easy to follow and, and I understand that they're familiar with it. And I also understand that there is some mistrust with the university because of past experiences that they've had. Um, needless to say, I'm regretful of that state of affairs and we are committed to working with them more closely going forward. You've heard me say that before and I've said that to them directly and Ed even mentioned the mechanism that we will be using going forward to work more closely together. Um, Regardless of that, there are public processes and there is accountability at the state level for Boise State and any future projects of impact in this area would have to run through multiple reviews and there would be an allowance for public input. Finally, let me just add that Boise State has made considerable investments in the interest of pursuing these vacations. Um, application fees in the amount of approximately $5,000 traffic impact study at 45,000, and Beacon Street improvements at approximately 300,000. Vacations of multiple streets at once like this will help save taxpayer dollars going forward from having to make future application fees or hiring consultants or doing more traffic studies over this area that might be unnecessary. We truly believe that this is a more efficient path forward for two public entities to take uh, and again, we appreciate your consideration. Thank you very much. All right. Any comments before I close the public hearing? Uh, Madam right. President? Hearing in? Oh, Commissioner Baker? Is there, is, um, is there an attorney here? Mr. Price? Maybe? Yes, I believe so. He Mr. Price is getting to the podium. Okay. okay, thank great. you. Thank you. So, I just had a question. Um, we vacate the property, and somewhere down the line, BSU decides to close off the roads to traffic. Is there any way to prevent that? Or once we vacate, we're, we're out of it completely? Mr. Price? Madam President, uh, Commissioner Steve Price, General Counsel, um, uh, Madam President, Commissioner Baker, once the roads have been vacated, then they are uh, under the control of the, the applicant uh, that they're awarded to. We don't have any control. We don't have jurisdiction over those roads any longer. So, so there's no guarantee. I mean, I assume that it's all being done in good faith now, but you know, 10, 20 years down the road, things may change and they may close it off and there's absolutely nothing that the public can do about it. Madam President, uh, Commissioner Baker, no, they, uh, they can make a commitment, okay. I suppose, but the answer is no. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Price. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. 
Any other comments or uh, questions, concerns, commissioners, before I close the public hearing? All right, hearing none, I will now close the public hearing. Commissioners, you have this item before you. Hello? I would be happy to entertain a motion. <laughs> well, Madam President, I'll, we're back where we were a month ago. And I don't know if I'm going to get a second, but I'm back where I was a month ago. And I'm going to uh, make a motion that we um, do not approve resolu the resolution that is before us. Um, for, the, for the reasons that I stated the last time, which is that I think it breaks up the um, the grid system in the road that we've heard from people. There, there has been testimony on the record about those uh, who do not want to um, think that this is in the public's interest. And so that's my motion. All right, Commissioner, there is a motion before us. Is there a second? I'll second Commissioner Baker's motion. Madam Chair. We have a motion and a second. Commissioner's discussion. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a substitute motion that we approve and adopt resolution 2306 and authorize the president to sign the quick claim deeds to implement that resolution. All right, we have a substitute motion. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second that. All right, we have a substitute motion with a second. Any further discussion on that? I think right. Commissioner would not like to speak first, so. I'm sorry, Commissioner Hanson, you were breaking up. Oh, I assume Commissioner Arnold would like to speak to our motion first, so I will defer. Okay, I'm sorry, Commissioner Arnold, I did not hear you. Uh, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Commissioner Hansen. Oh, okay. Since that, uh, no one wants to debate for the motion, I'll debate against it. Um, the um, I'll I'll make a comment after you. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll pause because no, no. Um, I I am uh, in support of the substitute motion. Um, I really I. I have thought a lot about this, and this has been going on for a decade. So obviously, this was before my my tenure on the commission. So I'm kind of a, uh, I guess, a fresh set of eyes and a fresh perspective. Um, it's it's a little puzzling that this can have been going on for a decade, and we get to this point. They come in to us. We tell them that we would like them to take care of X, Y, Z. They go. They take care of it. They've operated in good faith. They've been a good partner. Then they come back and it's voted down. So um, I just think there's an aspect of um, I don't I don't know a better word uh, fair play here. I don't um, I think the uh, comments that Sonia made about uh, improving the circulation, the connectivity. I think those are all valid. I think that will happen, um, and, and I do believe that Boise State is a, a good partner and they've acted in good faith and I have no no reason to think otherwise and I really have not heard anything compelling to make me um, pull my support for this uh, that's before us this evening. So I will be supporting the substitute motion. Well, with all due respect, Madam President, there's nothing in any of the documents that said we had to Absolutely, and I and and I and I know that I know that I just um, and, and like I say, I'm coming in. You know, I've only been on the commission for a year and a half, but my dealings with Boise State, and I think um, Randy addressed that. I think there there were some um, uh, disconnects with the prior administration, but with my time here, they have acted in good faith, 
and they have done what we've asked them to do and they have come back and I think um, the request is reasonable and I just personally I see no reason for me to uh, pull my support of it and my statements in no way shape or form are uh, directed at any commissioner I'm just talking about the situation um, in in total so I appreciate your comments and I and I realize that when an applicant comes to us there's never a guarantee until it's before the Commission and everybody votes so I, I do appreciate that Mr. Hansen did you uh, yeah. have a comment uh, only to the extent that uh, I was looking for some new and compelling evidence um, that would justify it in the public interest um, but the language of the resolution did not change whatsoever in fact the resolution even says at the public hearing on Wednesday June uh, 24 2020 uh, this action was taken so it, it doesn't even refer to this meeting uh, which is inaccurate and the definition of a traveling public I was told by council includes all modes the circulation plan I think is great the one that was developed in 2012 it's going to be updated I keep looking for a reason why a circulation plan like that can't function with ownership by two public agencies. So we have all kinds of examples of agencies that manage the, um, the streetscapes and so forth. And uh, I don't think there's any confusion. Once those buildings are built on the lot that people will, this, this is campus, this is on campus. Uh, Commissioner Baker makes a very important point, and that is this hasn't been built out yet and all kinds of things can change. Previous vacations, uh, significant vacations like St. Luke's referred to a building that was going to be built on top of the right of way. So there's no way any kind of circulation would have happened on that road. But the way in which we're proceeding here is the assumption that there'll be a, the same kind of circulation, you know, pedestrian, bicycle in some cases, um, cars, but you know, the bicycles and pedestrians have priority. Well, that can function fine under a uh, public ownership under ACHD and and the so the same concerns I raised last time um, are uh, are were not addressed because there was no new compelling evidence to change that what I'm very encouraged about and I really appreciate Randy is that you're working with the um, the neighborhood group the collegiate neighborhood group thank you and in fact I think you've operated in good faith uh, um, and I really appreciate you and the whole team at, at, at Boise State, I think you're turning over a new leaf opportunity to work with neighborhoods. Whenever there's a major change, either in land use development or in, in traffic and, and transportation, the very first um, group to engage is the neighborhood. The second group to engage is the neighborhoods, And the third group to engage is the neighborhoods throughout the process. And so I'm really encouraged that this whole process of the engaging the neighborhood uh, will be positive and that there'll be a, a strong buy-in by people who invested have invested their life savings um, invested their lives in many cases in those very neighborhoods and they're and, and I think they want to be good partners um, so I'm encouraged by that and I don't think this in any way will prevent either the circulation that BSU would like to have future development that it's going to put onto those those lots that are adjacent to those roads or um, uh, uh, the, the activities that BSU may may do in the future. So it, it just, you have to have a compelling interest, public interest. This is no longer necessary for the public to have this right away. And uh, um, the case just wasn't made last month and it wasn't made this month. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hansen. And I, and I do agree with his comments about um, neighborhood outreach. And that's certainly something that we believe in strongly here and exercise um, at ACHD. When you get that buy-in and you speak to the people that are impacted by any decisions going forward, it's a win-win for everybody. I think everybody comes away from the table with a little fresh knowledge and you've got that cooperative effort. And uh, when you're all working together, it only will yield a great benefit. So I would encourage you going forward to make sure that you keep um, on top of that robust outreach program. So that would be that would be a little pearl of wisdom too that I would tag on to what Commissioner Hansen said. So, all right, any further comments? Yes, Commissioner all right. May. All right, Commissioner Arnold. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as you pointed out, this has spanned a decade or longer and I've been around for the entire process. It's been a long 
and involved uh, process with Boise State. I think both agencies have acted in good faith and we have made some previous vacations and Boise State has made a number of significant improvements that um, were made at our request. So I'm going to support the uh, substitute motion and continue to move forward under the agreements that we have in place with Boise State. I would like to note though that the resolution does need to be corrected to uh, show the the correct date of the public hearing, which is July 22nd of 2020. All right, duly noted. Thank you very much, Commissioner Arnold. All right, commissioners, you have before you a motion. I will call for the vote. All in favor of the substitute motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, opposed? No. All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, next on our agenda, public communications, and we have Patricia Pit Pitzer. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Mary uh, Commissioner Baker. Yeah, just I'm on vacation, so okay. I'm going to say goodbye. F. Okay, all right, it's good to see you. Enjoy. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Madam President, members of the Commission. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm sorry to see uh, Commissioner Baker go. She's in my sister. Uh, so, uh, the reason I'm here tonight is that um, in May 2019, the ACHD held a, uh, a hearing for the line of HQ019 0027. Uh, and I'm here tonight to try to find out um, how to go about asking the Commission to review the application. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of erroneous... Madam Chair, we, we seem to have some difficulty hearing. Yeah, you are, you, you are breaking up a little bit, Patricia. Um, I, I, I do want to state that I did uh, forward your email on that we received um, this afternoon. And so um, I would like to have Mindy give you a call tomorrow so that you can discuss um, any sort of potential next steps. I think that probably would be the um, best avenue for you. We are having a little bit of a difficulty with your connection. You're certainly uh, welcome to continue, but I, but I will follow up and, and um, Ask Director Wong to please have Mindy uh, give you a call tomorrow so you can that discuss. Would right okay, that would be great. I don't, I'm, I'm sorry if the connection was bad. I discussed it beforehand, but you know, that's the technology. <laughs> thank you. Right. Okay, thank you, Patricia. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right, any other um, individuals to? Yes, we do. Uh, Mr. William Sargent, he does have. And if you can state your name and address for the record, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. And uh, good evening, Madam President and Commission members. My name is William Sargent, and I live at 5670 East Millet Drive in Boise. Um, I'm here tonight to... Uh, ask the commission to reconsider action taken by uh, upon request uh, and placing some no parking signs on East Millet Drive uh, two weeks ago. Um, par no parking signs were placed on both sides of East Millet Drive, um, an area that uh, has uh, relatively light traffic flow and that uh, uh, and by placing those no parking signs on both sides of the street, it has uh, created quite a hindrance for residents uh, along what's called phase two of the triplet ranch development. It's my understanding that uh, the um, uh, prior commission, Ada County Highway District Commission of, I believe, the year 2006 
recommended that no parking be um, uh, allowed on both sides of East Millet Drive in the section that I am referring to. I am referring to a very short section uh, between the entrance and exits uh, along this phase two. Phase two of uh, Triplet Ranch is a development of about 18 two and three story homes that have an access road to them uh, that uh, is, a, is fire uh, lane restricted. So there is no parking allowed um, in front of our homes other than in our immediate driveway. Parking has been allowed uh, in, in the, since I've been here, um, which is five years, parking has been allowed between the, the, um, the fire lane entrances of, our, of those homes along East Millet Drive. I hope I'm not making this too confusing. Um, and then uh, two weeks ago, no parking, three no parking signs were placed there. I would just ask the commission to, uh, for approval to remove those no parking signs to allow the residents of, uh, of uh, phase two of Triplet Ranch subdivision an opportunity to once again park on East Millet Drive. Um, I'm sorry I don't have uh, 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 any displays for you to see this. And, uh, and this lies within uh, District 1, uh, Commissioner Hansen's area. I would be happy to discuss this uh, with the commissioner uh, if there would uh, need be uh, further edification on this. Uh, but uh, thank, uh, Mr. Sergeant, thank you very much. We appreciate you sharing your concerns. We do not make decisions during the uh, public communication segment, but um, we have noted your concerns, and I believe we've had a few telluses about this as well. So um, I would venture to say that the commissioners are aware of your concerns. And so what I will do is, again, uh, speak with Director Wong and have the appropriate uh, staff members speak to you about next steps, and um, we will go from there, if that is agreeable to you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Our yes. pleasure. Thank you, sir, for, for coming. Madam, with me. Madam President. Oh, I, if, I'm sorry. If, Commissioner Hanson. Madam, Madam President, if Casey could just forward his my phone number to him, I'd be happy to visit with him and take a look at uh, that road. I'm familiar with some of those roads out there. And that's a weird one because their houses don't actually come directly on the East Millet. They go onto a, a lane that's detached from it. So it's kind of a unique Very good. So, Yeah. If Stacy wouldn't mind emailing my uh, contact information. To, Very good. To Sounds like you'll be getting a few phone calls. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you Thank for you. coming this evening. All right, any other uh, individuals signed up, Stacy? I do not have any more signed up. All right, Director Wong, did you have something that you would like to say? I saw you approach the podium. Madam President, no? just to let you know that uh, we have your direction on that. We'll be uh, working oh. with, with the gentleman. Okay, very much, there, thank you very much. All right, um, no other comments uh, this evening, so with that, uh, commissioners, I will adjourn. Have a good evening, and I will see you, well, Friday. Don't forget we have our meeting with Garden City. Have a good evening. We stand adjourned.